It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. The show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on Monday, December 7th. Uh, LA Galaxy still out of the playoffs, but, uh, you know, speaking of the playoffs, the the, uh, the Columbus crew now set to match up with the Seattle Sounders and Minnesota, and Seattle just got done playing a really exciting game, if you uh, if you saw that. So um, some MLS news certainly on this, and we're going to talk a whole bunch about that, and then we have some rumors and some coaching updates and some other little tidbits here. We'll throw and cobble together some of these things to get you some Galaxy content here as we go forward. So, um, to help me do all that is the panda himself, Mr. Kevin Baxter. Kevin, how you doing? Oh, man. Remember when the Galaxy used to be playing in MLL, MLS Cup Finals? I, it, I, 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 do, I do remember that. It feels like it was forever ago. Yeah, it really wasn't that long ago. I mean, historically, but um, that game tonight, Minnesota and Seattle, a uh, tough way for Minnesota to lose. Taking a 2-1 lead into the final minute of regulation and then giving up two goals that but it just shows you seattle i saw a stat on the the broadcast seattle has scored minnesota now nine to two or maybe it's ten to two in the last 15 minutes of of games when the two uh, have met you know minnesota's only been in the league for you know since 2017 so it's not that many games but um seattle just never quits they, they had the most goals in mls in the second half of the season they just never quit can you imagine being the Seattle Sounders and somehow not already already having Brian Schmetzer wrapped up to an extension? I mean, that's why whenever we talk about coaches, Brian Schmetzer is going to be mentioned, but it's not going to be serious. It can't be serious because how is Seattle going to let Brian Schmetzer go on the cusp of another MLS Cup? Um, if he wins an MLS Cup and walks away for some reason, something went wrong. Something went like sideways and, and went real wrong real fast. So that, that there's a reason why the LA Galaxy probably won't be in the Brian Schmetzer, uh, you know, race, right? Ooh, 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 ooh. Yes. I know this one. Yes. I know a little bit about this. Yes, I actually I, I had a chance to talk to Brian um, a couple of weeks ago before the Galaxy, the last Galaxy game. Uh, he was at that time. He was very upset, not about his situation, but by the situation of his uh, assistant coaches. Now that coaching staff has been so successful it's just not brian smetzer that needs to get more money it's that whole coaching staff and and that's a lot of money to come up with a lot of raises to come up with in the middle of a pandemic when you're not you don't have any fans in the stands so that's his that's where brian smetzer is a little bit disappointed not in his contract he believes something will get done with him whether he accepts it or not hinges on the treatment that his assistant coaches get he's very very loyal to them but there's a couple things here this mls cup next Saturday will be his fourth in five seasons. Yep. Um, that, that That's Bruce arena like, mm-hmm. um, um, but it, it, and it won't be in Seattle. We can talk about that later if you, if you like, but um, fourth in five seasons, the problem is trying to get Brian Smith to go somewhere else. It's going to take a lot of money uh, right. or something because he spent his whole life. He was born in Seattle, played most of his career in Seattle, coached when the team was in the NASL coached when the team was in USL Um uh, you know, he's he's Seattle guy, born and bred, trying to get him to leave his home of 50-some years. It's going to be really, really difficult. And I don't think he's going to be one of those coaches. I do think he'll be a candidate for the Galaxy. I, I think they'd be stupid not to talk to him. Maybe he's looking for a challenge and, and to, to seek out new horizons. But um, he's so comfortable in Seattle, and he's a legend there. It would be hard to, for me to see him moving. By the way, you, you said it really wasn't that long ago for the LA Galaxy being in MLS Cups. It's been 2000. 2000- 192 days since the LA Galaxy were last in an MLS Cup. They won it. That was 2014. Uh, and uh, there are only 190 days, and I think we've talked about this before. And in fact, I know we've talked about it on the podcast. I don't know if I've talked about it with you on the podcast, but that means that there are just 190 days until June 15th, 2021. And we've talked about June 15th before being the day where the LA Galaxy will match their longest streak ever without an MLS Cup. Um, so that's that, that's what's coming up next year, June 15th, when the LA Galaxy, which they're not going to get to an MLS Cup between now and then. So the LA Galaxy will have a new record, Kevin, for the longest time between MLS Cups. For, well, but for, between MLS Cup appearances, that, that yeah. they already have that record. This is the longest they've gone between MLS Cup appearances. 
It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it just won the consistency of the team, you know, over a set period of time, but also just the the collapse that we've seen in, in, in recent times. I mean, certainly 2017 and 2020 have been the two statistically worst years in uh, in, in LA Galaxy history. Um, and so you have those two years within three years of each other, and you've done not much in between. I mean, look, okay, Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota took the step forward from what they did last year, right? The LA Galaxy went to the playoffs last year. They beat Minnesota, um, and they got knocked out in the next round. So Minnesota went to the first round of the playoffs, lost, and then this time they go, and they're in a Western Conference final. They took the correct steps. They got back to where they were supposed to be. They built something smart, and they ended up having um, just a a great, great run um, in the quote-unquote second half of the season. Um, So you're seeing what can happen when you set things up correctly and when you take the next step. Steps, but I mean, it, it's been one step forward, two steps back for the galaxy here for for quite a long time, and in most cases, it's one step forward, four or five steps backwards uh, when things don't uh, don't go their way. So um, it's just a stark contrast. You look at Caleb Porter; the galaxy could have had Caleb Porter. Uh, he's an MLS Cup with the Columbus Crew. You know, you look at Brian Schmetzer, who might be a candidate for the LA Galaxy, but it seems unlikely, as we talked about. Um, you know, you look at all these things and the people who've had success around the LA Galaxy, but yet the LA Galaxy have had no success in recent times. So uh, I don't know. I watch all these games and I, I remember the Galaxy playing in these games. I remember them being contenders like that, Kevin. But um, something something has changed and it's not for the better. And so something else has to change in order for all this stuff to, to sort of go that way. Does that, does that make some sense? Yeah, but and I think you hit on something earlier that it, it just talks about the great consistency and how good the Galaxy traditionally, and I'm not talking about now, traditionally have been as an organization, but the league has changed so much. When the Galaxy first started, they were the they were the rich franchise. They were the powerful franchise. They pretty much dominated a, a, a league that had only 10 teams. So it wasn't that difficult. And then all of a sudden, uh, the league got stronger. The league got bigger. It was tougher to win. There was a lot of salary rules that made it difficult to to put together winning teams year over year. Well, the, the Galaxy got lucky because they brought in Bruce Arena, and he was a genius at that. I mean, we're both part, you know, big fans of Bruce, as everybody knows. And But when you look at what Bruce did with the salary cap, with all the restrictions, and then just as a coach to make MLS Cup final, you know, uh, win three and four seasons, right? It, that that was just remarkable. But then Bruce, or even when Bruce was about to leave, remember, he didn't make the MLS Cup final his last two years. He went out early in the playoffs. Um, things were starting to catch up. The league was bigger. The, uh, there were more uh, powerful and rich owners coming into the league. Like, uh, you know, you have Atlanta, now LAFC. Um, it became, and the salary rules, again, made it much more difficult to re-sign players that had played well because they all deserved raises. It, it just got very difficult to win. Now, other teams have figured it out, and the Galaxy haven't been able to. And I think, you know, if you look at the problems in the front office, you know, the Galaxy have gone through four coaches and 66 players, but the front office has remained most mostly the same over the last four years. So um, the Galaxy have not changed with the times. Um, I, I'm not saying they got lucky at the beginning. They, they were they, – they knew how to play the league. They, they knew what the league was about, and they knew how to make the rules work f- to their advantage. It, it's not that same kind of league anymore. It, it's a much larger league, a lot of different playing styles. Travel is different. Um, it's a much harder place to win. But the Galaxy just not have, have, have not adapted and made the – the, the adjustments that everybody else has seemed to be able to make. Yeah, I was going to say the counter to all that is that everybody else has been able to make these adjustments, or at least, you know, a large portion of the league. I mean, you can say all you want about that, but look at how you want to talk about one of the most consistent teams in Major League Soccer, it's the Seattle Sounders. I mean, 12 years in the league now, and they haven't missed the playoffs once in any of those years. Uh, that's a ridiculous ridiculous record and if it wasn't for Bruce Arena imagine how many Bruce Arena and the LA Galaxy imagine how many MLS Cups Seattle would have probably two or three more is my guess uh, just off the top of my head trying to remember all those Western Conference finals or at least early round games um, slightly earlier round games between the LA Galaxy and the Seattle Sounders I mean it's they, that was um, during its time in 2010 2011 2012 like right in that 2011 2012 2013 2014 that's that stretch there it was seattle as one of the biggest rivals of the la galaxy and you can say oh well it can't be a rivalry if it changes but look at what those teams played against each other and how many times they played in the postseason against each other and how many regular season battles felt like playoff games um, when was the last time outside of Vanel Trafico, Kevin, and certainly not this year, but when was the last time a regular season game felt like a playoff game for an LA Galaxy? It, it's 
it's been a while and it was usually it was probably Zlatan and it was probably a Zlatan game against somebody who was who was bigger but again most of those games are probably going to be El Traficos and those tend to have their own sort of atmosphere around them but it used to be you know New York Red Bulls coming in with Thierry Henry would come in and play against David Beckham those games felt like playoff games in the middle of the season uh, Seattle Sounders would come in and that game felt like a playoff game Real Salt Lake you know back in 2010 2011 2012 uh, even 2009 if you want to throw that in there as well uh, those games like felt like playoff games and it feels like the LA Galaxy have not had that type of energy here in uh, in quite a while um, well, and, and, that's my observation and speaking of energy you watched that game tonight and I, I, I bet a lot of our listeners did an empty stadium in Seattle I mean that you know they have for years and years until Atlanta entered the league Seattle was second in the in the western hemisphere we're talking about South America Mexico and North America second in average attendance you know they'd average over 40 almost 40,000 a game only Club America did better that building would have been rocking tonight. Can you imagine a, a capacity stadium there with uh, the Sounders scoring those two goals late to win that game, what that place would have been like? And then what it could have been like for the MLS Cup final, the march to the match, another sold-out stadium, uh, what it could have been like for Saturday. Unfortunately, the game. For, unfortunately for Seattle, the game won't be home Saturday. They right. will have to go on the road to Columbus. And, and it's so – I mean, it, you look at, uh, at what a weird year this has been. Seattle had a home game with Colorado – when they were playing very well, and in fact, they had the best record in the conference at home, they would have won that game. If they had won that game, they would have finished with 42 points. That would have given them uh, the, the home field advantage for the final. That game was not played, uh, so they finished with 39 points. Columbus finished with 41. So Columbus gets to host that home game uh, in MLS Cup final because Seattle didn't play that Colorado game. And, and not only did they finish behind Columbus in in straight points but also points per game by, by one one hundredth so columbus gets that home game why is that important well columbus has only lost once at home all season including the playoffs but they didn't win on the road i gotta believe it was a totally different game if that game is played in seattle and it, it, if it's played in columbus where it will be played um you know seattle hasn't lost a home playoff game since 2013 I know. now they have to go on the road because of that columbus game and it wasn't seattle's fault yeah. The COVID nineteen outbreak was with the Rapids, but yet it cost Seattle a home playoff, uh, a home a home game in the MLS Cup final, biggest game of the year. Yeah, uh, just another reason that twenty twenty sucks. I was just personal note. Uh, we were just going through sort of holiday plans for for Christmas, and I was hoping my son would be able to come out from Colorado uh, and be able to do the whole the whole. And we canceled that, and so I'm very much uh, on this day, particularly uh, in the twenty twenty sucks. Uh, I'm ready for 2021, and I'm hoping that it'll be better, and I'm hoping the things. But uh, as I remind everybody, please stay safe this holidays. It's going to suck, and next year, um, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun. So next holiday season, it's on. Fingers crossed. Everything works well that way. But next holiday season is on. Uh, as I pointed out in the 1917-1918 uh, uh, Spanish flu pl- pandemic that this certainly killed a lot of people and had a vast effect on the, on the United States and around the world, uh, after that was over and everything sort of got back to normal, they had the Roaring Twenties, Kevin, right? So we're, we're getting ready to, to, to head into the Roaring Twenties, the 2020s, um, again. So every 100 years or so, we throw a giant party around the world. Let's hope that in the next you know 10 years, we get to play that out. So that's my, my thoughts. Not only has it ruined soccer, but now it's ruining you know mine and a whole bunch of other people's Christmases and their holidays. Um, and I'm looking forward to 2021 where we get to watch games that are live, Kevin, with fans in the stands and everybody is healthy and safe and can do it. Um, and this MLS Cup is just going to draw a, a final curtain for me on a season that is unforgettable, absolutely, but is something that I'll try to forget for the rest of my life. I hope our Roaring Twenties, we have better dances than they had back then. Uh, come on, man. You don't want to go flapper style? The 20s, the 20s were no. fun. The 20s were fun. I mean... Some not- of the dress... Some of the, 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 the dress was was nice. I like some of the dresses, you know, men and women, what they wore. The hats were great. Right. Dances, uh, I'm not so sure. Maybe that's what we should, we should bring back, the top hats. I think we. I think that's what needs to happen. Top hats. That's that's the answer to everything. All right. Uh, let's get a little bit to, uh, to Greg Vanny and the LA Galaxy. Now... As you'll remember, and as I told everybody on Thursday night, there was a rumor going around the LA Galaxy would announce Greg Vanny by the end of last week. Well, here it is on Monday. 
not the end of last week, beginning of next week, and there's been nothing there. Well, what do you know? We told you that that was, wasn't going to happen. Here's what's happening with the LA Galaxy, and we have a little bit further news to the, thanks to some very good reporting from uh, Sam Steschkel from The Athletic as well. But we told you the LA Galaxy had interviews scheduled for last week and have interviews scheduled for this week. It seems as if the LA Galaxy are going to go through all those interviews, Kevin, which you would do if you set up interviews. Uh, they're going to go through all those interviews. As a matter of fact, they're going to go through all those interviews, and according to Sam Steschkel at The Athletic, he's saying they haven't even cr- contacted Vanny yet which makes sense when you think about the timeline of things, right? They set up interviews before Vanny had announced that he was coming out, um, that he was not going to be there for Toronto anymore. Um, and so there was there was no interview to get set up because he had not officially separated himself from Toronto yet. So uh, having said all that, I would imagine that the Galaxy will reach out and contact uh, Greg Vanny. Uh, he makes a ton of sense, which we've talked about a whole bunch of times. Uh, but Again, the Galaxy are going to go through this interview process. They're going to take their time. And and I don't know that anything really happens before the end of the year. And that's not that far off. So it feels like a comfortable thing to sort of say that. I mean, do you see anything that's going to change that rapidly there, Kevin? No, I, and, and I think if the Galaxy thought that Vanny was the favorite, which, I mean, it, it seemed like he would be. I don't know what the Galaxy are thinking, but let's just assume that maybe they think he's the favorite. You probably want to save that interview for last anyways. Make sure that you do all of your due diligence as we've seen, you know, when the season ended, we and a lot of other people were saying, Dom, Dominic Kinnear's got to get the job, got to hire Dominic Kinnear. We need to do it right now. There's roster decisions to make. Galaxy waited, and what happened? Greg Vanny and now uh, um, Vieira now have become available. Um, uh, Va- uh, Vieira sacked in Nice, and then Vanny leaving Toronto. They've become available. They weren't available when the season ended, and everyone was screaming to hire Dominic Kinnear. So it makes sense for the Galaxy to take time as long as they're aware of what Atlanta and DC United is doing in their coaching searches. Cause certainly you don't want to lose your top candidate to another MLS team, but a couple of interesting things about the Vanny thing that I haven't seen, uh, uh, maybe these dots put together this way. Vanny said that uh, a contract extension was done, was agreed to, but not signed in late October, uh, in Toronto. Well, why is that important? That's important because that's when Guillermo Berescoloto, uh, was fired. So, Presumably, you can make a case that Vanny was prepared to come back to Toronto. Scalotto was fired and then all of a sudden decided not to sign the contract that he had already agreed to because he wanted to t- test the waters with the Galaxy. So why didn't he say something then? Well, because Toronto was in the playoffs. You know, one thing you're, you're not going to do on your way out the door is you're not going to resign your post while your team is going to the playoffs and become a distraction. So that was the professional thing to do. Um it, would he want to leave a team like Toronto that's very, very successful, almost won the Supporter Shield this year, and come to uh, the Galaxy team that, as we said, is a mess? Absolutely. Why would he want to do that? Well, he said, look, what I'm, what I'm good at is building. I like projects. Uh, my, my work here in Toronto is done. Remember when he took over Toronto, it was a terrible team. Yep. And he took it to an MLS Cup title, a, a treble, uh, Supporter Shield. They also won the Canadian Cup. Um, so... This is a guy that likes to come in and build things, and that's what he excels at. He was part of the original Galaxy team, played over 200 games for the Galaxy, was, in a, was a coach here, I believe, right? Or no, he coached the Chivas, I know. He did coach in Carson. Um, so he's a guy that's been around the team, been around the building, been around the organization as a, as a great player um, and is well aware of the resources the Galaxy has, the tradition the Galaxy has. Um, it, with, you know, it knows what he's getting himself into, and and – embraces the idea that it would be a building project. Um, it's a team that has a lot of resources. So uh, the one drawback, and you and I talked about this earlier, is his last two years in Toronto, he was coach and general manager. So if he were to come here under under DeClosa, he would have to give up a little bit of that power. And we know Bruce Arena didn't want to do that. And when Bruce Arena went to New England, um, he said, I'm not coming unless I get both positions. And so they fired the coach and general manager to create room for Bruce. Would Vanny want to do that, and would the Galaxy then fire DeClosa? I don't think so. I, I don't think, A, Vanny would ask for that, and I don't think they'd fire DeClosa, um, you know, just to get a coach. On the other hand, I'm thinking perhaps he likes that idea um, because his best season was 2017 in Toronto, and he had a general manager then. General manager was fired the next year. In the last two seasons, Vanny was the general manager and coach. He may enjoy the idea of getting back to focusing on coaching and letting somebody else worry about contracts and other things. So, um, I, I definitely think he's the favorite at this point, and I think the Galaxy are wise to um, 
you know, do their due diligence and, and, and keep the process slow and not get ahead of themselves. They've made their roster decisions. They know what they're doing. Um, I think they're in good position. Uh, now just take their time and make sure they make the right decision and not the, the fastest decision possible. Well, I mean, the other part of that, that you talk about the roster decisions is they've really left a lot open to whoever comes in to make decisions because while they, you know, straight out option declined three people, they option declined another three where they're still negotiating. Uh, they have three out of contract, which they say they're still negotiating on. So, I mean, they've, they've left themselves a lot of room to negotiate. Um, and so, it, you know, whoever comes in and sort of takes a has some flexibility in this roster and can still make some decisions, it seems, at least at this point. So, um, yeah, a lot of interesting things. I'll, I'll point out that one of our listeners was listening to our show on Thursday, and I said, hey, you know, Greg Vanny's great, and he's done a lot of things for the LA Galaxy, but, you know, he's never actually won an MLS Cup with the LA Galaxy. Uh, Fernando came on and says, yes, that is true, but he did win an, uh, an Open Cup and is one of the very few players in MLS history that can say he's a CONCACAF champ with an MLS team as well. So um, he did uh, he did do both of those things with the LA Galaxy uh, whenever that was in vogue. So uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of Galaxy history, certainly, that Vanny can lean on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he wants to be back in Southern California. Uh, certainly the weather choices, I think, between the two are probably pretty striking. So uh, he seems like a ridiculously hard worker. We'll see if the LA Galaxy go out and contact them. I expect that they will. I did have somebody drop his name um, just about the time, a couple days before he actually announced that he was not going to be re-signing with Toronto. So um, it was one of those sort of aha moments, and then uh, you, you get that he's uh, he's no longer with Toronto. And so there, it seems that there are some stars aligning with, with Vanny, and it would take no genius to say, I, I said this, it's so easy to pull the trigger on two of these guys, which is, you know, Dominic Kinnear, who I think has an almost equal record, except for the galaxy ties, the pure galaxy ties. Um, Dominic Kinnear does as, as Vanny does. Um, Dominic Kinnear has a ton of success in major league soccer, has won a couple of MLS cups, um, you know, has, has really put some teams together and rebuilt teams into um, some really good, um, solid uh, competing teams. And so when you look at Dominic Kinnear and Greg Vanny, I'm not sure you could go wrong, but whoever you're going to pick, there's going to be criticism uh, going the other way. And if you pick neither of those, people are going to smack you on the back of the head and said you had the easy choices in front of you and you went this way. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of pressure. It's funny, Kevin, you, you look at these and you can say, you know, Vanny is definitely like he's that's sort of like a low pressure. Like, duh, you, you signed Greg Vanny. Um, the problem is if you pass on somebody. Let's say you pass on Dominic Kinnear and Dominic Kinnear goes somewhere else and then all of a sudden Dominic is, you know, successful somewhere. This same, we just played out the same scenario. Guillermo Barrescoloto and Caleb Porter, right? Caleb Porter's in an MLS Cup. Guillermo Barrescoloto has been fired. Which one would you rather have if you could go back and look in your crystal ball? Some people are going to tell you Caleb Porter. I've told you I still wouldn't have made that choice. It didn't matter if I knew where, sort of where things were going. Um, but... You can second guess these things. So so look at what's going to happen between Greg Vanny, Dominic Kinnear, and any of these other names that have sort of, you know, Juan Carlos Osorio. Uh, what if Juan Carlos Osorio comes back into Major League Soccer and he has success there? So there's going to be this second guessing of the LA Galaxy and the decisions that they make uh, up and down, uh, regardless of who they pick. And so in my mind, it's just make make your pick here relatively in, in short order after you've done your due diligence. And you can certainly say that you've talked to a whole bunch of people. You make that choice and, and then you live with it because that's ultimately what you're going to have to do. If Greg Vanny is the guy, he has a track record. He has a track. He has enough of a track record in my mind, Kevin, um, and success recently uh, in Major League Soccer to get some pretty good leeway from the fans uh, and some pretty good leeway from, you know, the the front office. So, I, you know, a two or three year coach seems like something the LA Galaxy actually need for real, though. You actually need to keep somebody for like two or three years, not one and a half or one and three quarter seasons or however you want to sort of characterize, you know, Gamber Barish Galoto on that. So um, it, it's well, gonna, you, Yeah. I was going to say, you know, what's interesting is you bring up Caleb Porter. It was it was two years ago this week that uh, the Laker game that we all remember where Caleb Porter was sitting. Um, um, I, well, yeah, was sitting courtside with uh, with Beckerman and Chris Klein and Dennis DeClosa. And, and that was the way the, the, the Galaxy have traditionally made announcements is they publicly have, uh, you know, people seen together in courtside at a Laker game. It's one place to be seen. Um, I was told at that point that the uh, negotiations were going so well that the Galaxy were even starting to plan a news conference for the following week because they just assumed Caleb Porter uh, was going to be their new coach. Those talks broke down before the Lakers played another game even, uh, and and Caleb Porter started talking to Columbus. One of the hangups I was told was over the length of the deal 
um, that Caleb Porter wanted a uh, uh, an extra year, and and the Galaxy weren't uh, eager to grant that. And and the reason they didn't want to give him a long term contract was because at that time they were still paying Ziggy Schmidt and Kurt Anafo to not manage the team, coaches that had been fired but had long term contracts. They didn't want to get in that situation again with Caleb Porter in case things didn't work out. So they went another way. They went with Guillermo Barros Scalotto. Guess what? Guillermo's going to get a million dollars from the Galaxy for not coaching the team next year because he had a three-year contract. So things didn't work out to the way the Galaxy thought they were going to. Uh, um, and now Caleb Porter's in the MLS final with Columbus. Another guy that I think needs to be mentioned is Patrick Vieira. I mentioned him a minute ago. Um, Guillermo did, or excuse me, Dennis DeClosa did learn from this experience. One of the things he said is that the next coach will have to have MLS coaching experience or that he would prefer that you know he knew that Guillermo had played in MLS had been a successful player in MLS but had not coached here and that's a whole different experience so he's he said that you know one thing he's going to look at is the is the new manager's experience as a coach in MLS um, and we know that Vanny has done that we know that Dom has in fact Dom's won more MLS cups than Vanny has um, but Patrick Vieira coached the first two seasons for New York City FC uh, their uh, expansion season and their second season got them into the playoffs both times was a very successful coach and the other thing that he adds and this can't be discounted with the galaxy because the galaxy like big names big personalities big resumes Patrick Vieira is a world cup champion played with some of the biggest clubs in Europe uh, then came over here and managed so he ticks that box off too um, he would be a a a big personality in the dressing room, I think, if if any of the players, and, and I'm not saying that this happened, but if, it, you know, a guy that might be able to get Chicharito in line or Dos Santos or any of the other big-name players, um, Pavone, some of these guys with World Cup experience, Vieira's going to be able to come back to them and say, yeah, you played in the World Cup. I won one. Um, and and so I think that, that that might be something the Galaxy is interested in looking at. When you look at their history, they do like those big-name guys, even as managers, and I think Vieira, for all of Vanny's success, for all of Dominic's success, what it, Patrick Vieira has done on the global stage uh, kind of ups that a little bit. And I think that's going to be very interesting to the Galaxy. I definitely expect them to kick the tires on him. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Uh, I would ex- I would expect an interview. I'd expect to reach out to a uh, contact, so we'll see uh, if that happens. A little bit of focus on the youngsters for the LA Galaxy as well this week. Uh, Julian Araujo and Efrain Alvarez both in camp with the U.S. men's national team. I think we mentioned this on, on Thursday. Um, it's it's just, for, first of all, let's talk about Efrain Alvarez because I know we have some, some interesting sort of growth uh, you know, uh, uh, lessons or, or things that we've seen with, with Julian Araujo. So let's start with Efrain Alvarez. Uh, Greg Berhalter was talking a lot about him. Uh, Kevin, we know that he is with the U.S. men's national team camp right now. He will not be playing in the game, but he is visiting to take a look. Uh, currently, he is tied to uh, the youth Mexican national team slash the Mexican national team uh, because he's played in the U-17 World Cup for Mexico. Um, so, so uh, you know, Efrain Alvarez is, is seems to be a hot commodity still on the at least the international market and of where he's going to go and sort of how he's going to play. Uh, we, you were on the call, I think, with Greg Berhalter when he was talking about FRI and what what did you hear from from the US men's national team coach? Well, one of the things I picked up right away is what has been sort of the Achilles heel of Efrain Alvarez. It's always people talking about his fitness. He doesn't appear fit. He doesn't seem to be working hard at being fit. Um, and I was really um, surprised that Greg Berhalter picked up on that. Um, he one of the he said what I've seen from him in training is a maturity a development as a player over the last year. And then his next sentence was, he looks much more physically fit. He's able to impact games for longer. It's unfortunate he didn't play more. And then talked about his playing style. He said, he's a guy you want to be around the ball. He's a very creative player, has a good change of pace. He's very good in tight spaces. I can see him playing in an attacking midfield role as a winger, even as a number nine. To me, he's a quality player. So um, Greg Berhalter, of, sort, of course, isn't going to say anything negative when he's trying to recruit the player to the team. Right. But he seems pretty high on Alvarez and the things he can do. And I, my sense is you see a lot of young players called in to the U.S. national team. Their last two camps, both the one in Europe and this one, the average age has been 22. Um, they're looking at, at at the Olympics, which is a U23 tournament. And you got guys like Julian Araujo 
uh, 19, Efrain Alvarez at 18, a lot of other young players. Um, I don't think Efrain Alvarez, e- even as good as Greg Berhalter says he is, is going to step in and play midfield uh, on the U.S. senior national team. But I definitely think he's a guy that they would really love to have in Tokyo for the Olympics this summer. It, 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 listen, this is all about when you know when you try to take what is happening on the national team level and and you know project it onto the club level. Any amount of interest for Efrain Alvarez, uh, any amount of training at a national team level is going to be good for Efrain Alvarez, and therefore should be good for the LA Galaxy. Um, I'll say, and and knowing that Greg Berhalter is much smarter than me, um, no soccer much better than me, I'll say that uh, right now in my mind this feels like the uh, like the U.S. men's national team is attempting to make sure that Mexico doesn't get a guy who may or may not pan out in the long run. Um, but if Efrain Alvarez was to find out that the that he w- likes the U.S. men's national team better, um, then he you know he files the one time switch. Then then the U.S. has now locked him into a position where he can't go and help Mexico. Uh, I think for Efrain's development in the national team, it seems like he may be a better fit for the Mexican national team right now, which. Kevin, you and I have talked about is uh, is longer in the tooth is a much older team and therefore will need to have younger players. Um, and so it certainly seems like in my mind, if Efrain Alvarez reaches the potential that everybody has said that he has, he'd get better playing opportunities. I think right now with Mexico than he would with the U S men's national team, but there's a lot of gamesmanship going on here. And I think as long as both of these players, Julian Rajo and Efrain Alvarez understand that, you know, the, the club part of their game is what ends up getting them to the national team. I think that it, it can really only benefit the, the LA galaxy. Yeah. I mean, he's getting experience. He's getting to, uh, to play and train with, with better players, players of his own caliber. And, and, uh, you know, not to, not to say that there weren't a lot of those players at the galaxy, but I mean, everyone, they're on the national team for a reason. Um, and, and so that's going to help him. One of the things I really like about what Greg Berhalter is doing, or at least what he says he's doing, of course, we're not there at training, is what he says is with all these dual nationals, he had 12 dual nationals in camp in Europe last week. I think he said he has seven or eight in camp uh, for Wednesday's game with El Salvador. What he says is he's bringing them, he, he said, first of all, it's not unusual this day and age to see players with multiple passports and opportunity to go and play in other places. There's one guy he had in Europe that could play for three different na- uh, nationalities if he wanted to, nations if he wanted to. But what Greg Berhalter is saying is we're not going to pressure them. This is a decision that they have to make with their families. There's a lot of cultural ties that the family has back to the homeland. Um, you know, those are things that they need to sort out. What we want them to do is come in, look around, see how we do things, see if you fit in, and then we're going to leave you alone to make the decision. I really like that approach because if you pressure a guy to do something and it doesn't work out, then he's always going to blame you for that, and that's not going to be in the best interest of the team. The other thing is I think Greg Berhalter is saying, I have a lot of confidence with our program, mm-hmm. with um, our training setup, with our resources, uh, with the guys around the team. I believe this is the best place to be, and if you can, can just get them – to come look at this, I think that they're going to agree with us. So I think he, he's he's allowing the players to make the choice. He's allowing them to be mature and do what they want. But he also has a lot of confidence in his program and saying, I think if you come in here and look around, you're going to choose us. It just seems to me to be a very smart way to do business. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Well, you have the other side of this, too. You have Julian Araujo uh, with the U.S. men's national team, uh, likely to get some playing time whenever they play on the, is it the ninth? I keep It's the eighth or the ninth. Oh, the game, it's on Wednesday. Okay, yeah, it's on ninth. Wednesday. Okay, the ninth. Good. Just wanted to make sure I couldn't... I, I kept screwing it up. So uh, it, it's on uh, on Wednesday. It's likely that Julian Araujo will get some playing time in this game, uh, which will give him his first cap for the United and, States. And, yes. Right, but not, it doesn't cap time, obviously, because it's a friendly. Also, there'll be fans there. It'll be Julian Araujo's first game, home game, with fans um, since March, right? Yeah, probably. I don't know. Did they play anywhere else where there are fans? In well, the well they played on the road, but this he'll be he'll be the home team. He'll this be time, the home so. team this time. Okay, yes. Good. They play in Fort Lauderdale in in the uh, temporary stadium that uh, Inter Miami used this season. Way to take a useless stat and make it just slightly useful um, in in yeah. in the fans game. But yes, um, you know it, it's it's important. But the the funny thing was there was some media out today. Uh, Julian Araujo doing some media. Um, people were were asking him, and obviously there's a lot of Zoom calls going on. And that's how all these virtual press conferences are going. So Araujo does his press conference, uh, leaves, and apparently uh, still with an open mic. And I was lo- looking at Jonathan Tannenwald um, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, who's on Twitter, and you know uh, the goal, uh, Jonathan. 
and he does a great job. Um, he's he was out there saying, yeah, Julian Araujo could be heard, you know, off off the screen saying, man, all they want to do is talk about my dual nationality and you know who, but who I'm going to play for. Um, it, it's it's an interesting conundrum for for Julian Araujo, but this is, I mean, ultimately until he decides who he wants to play for, and it's the same with you know Efrain Alvarez until they actually make that decision. That's going to be the question for these guys because Julian Araujo is an up and coming talent. Uh, we've talked about him possibly going to Europe sooner rather than later, and I heard that there seemed like um, the the LA Galaxy and Julian Araujo were prepared to see him depart this winter. Uh, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen, and it's probably going to be more of a summertime thing if it does happen now, uh, but I, there were rumors, at least, that uh, that Julian Araujo was was ready to depart and that teams were interested, but that the LA Galaxy were were so... I don't want to say bad, but bad that the LA galaxy were so bad, Kevin, uh, that teams couldn't quite evaluate Julian Araujo. Was he just a, an okay player on a really bad team or was he, you know, a really good player on a bad team? Uh, and so there's some question marks about that. And so maybe if that gets sorted out a little bit for the LA galaxy, Julian Araujo has a repeat of sort of the season that he had, um, and builds upon that. I, I would expect that you might see him gone in summer, but what? going back to this, this media thing that was going on, well, I mean, but- Julian's going to get a lot move, of the stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Before you move on from that, that's an interesting thing. I had not heard that story, but um, that makes this friendly um, if Julian Araujo does get some playing time. And then they're going to – Greg Berhalter has already said there's going to be a January camp with a January friendly. Those are two games where that's not going to be an issue, a bad team. He's going to be playing for the U.S. national team. Um, even if it's a second-rate U.S. national team, it's going to be better than the Galaxy last year. Um, that's going to give those scouts a chance to see him. And if he uh, progresses with the national team, either in, in the U23s and in, in the World Cup team or World, uh, excuse me, Olympic team, or if he plays, say, in, in Nations League or is on the team that plays in Gold Cup, that's going to give those European scouts a much better idea of uh, what Julian Araujo is like. So, you know, if he gets a, a decent amount of playing time in this game on Wednesday, um, that could change the whole equation that you're talking about. Scout saying we don't really know how good he is because we didn't see him with good players. Yeah, and and now go back to this this whole complaint. And and listen, I think we have an observation, Kevin. You and I have an observation because we're because one, I was lucky enough to tag along with you. Two, you were stupid enough to forget your recorder, which made me useful to you during this. But we got to talk to Julian Araujo. We got to talk to his family before a game and this was right this was 2019 uh this was right when julian araujo was coming this was right before his debut yeah it was right before his debut he was a soft-spoken shy kid and you and i are seeing quite a different kid recently yeah, and you like that a lot. I know. I do. I do. I like the feisty. He's not. He's not. He's not shy. He's confident. Um, I like the fact he's complaining about the questions. Uh, quite honestly, um, I. By the way, that wouldn't change if I had. You know, first of all, if I'm talking to Julian Araujo, it's because he plays for the LA Galaxy, so it's a little bit different than if I was trying to cover him for the U.S. Men's National Team. The story for the U.S. Men's National Team is: Are you going to pick the United States? You're going to go to Mexico. That's the story. And you know why? You know why that is because. He's been asked that question. I ask him that, and others have too. And he said, flat out, whoever ge- uh, you know shows me the love and gives me the first offer, that's where I'm going. He's not capped tied to either side yet. He remains a free agent. And he's basically said, hey, what are you going to do for me? And yes. whoever does the most for me, that's where I'm going. So those questions are totally, you know, I'm sorry, Julian, but those questions are totally appropriate until you answer them and say, I am going to play for Mexico because my parents come from there and this is a present for my parents. Or as the Roldans, you know, the Roldan brothers, they could have played uh, uh, for a number of different countries. And and uh, Christian Roldan was Seattle. And he said, you know, the U.S. gave my parents their immigrants from Guatemala and El Salvador. The U.S. gave my parents a chance at a better life. I owe it to the United States to play for the U.S. That was a good answer. Uh, El Salvador or Guatemala wasn't going to come in and say, hey, but what about us? Yeah. Um, that was a good answer. Efrain Alvarez, same thing. He played for the U.S. As a, a, on the U15 level, was not invited into a camp in the subsequent year, was left off the training camp roster and said, I'm out of here. And he went to Mexico and he's played 14 games for Mexico's youth program. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of a history with Efrain Alvarez and you kind of understand there's nothing with Julian Araujo. He hasn't said which way he's leaning or why he's leaning that way. So the, I, I get his frustration. He wanted to talk about himself and his game, but the questions I think are totally appropriate because he hasn't answered them yet. Yeah. yeah. By the way, you say there's no history. We have talked many times about his motivation perhaps for this year of not getting a or, or not getting playing time in the US men's national team camp he was called into last January. Remember when all of his 
family had come down in the anticipation that he might play and he didn't play. And we have used that at least to say that that was some motivation for him, a chip on his shoulder uh, to sort of show the U S men's national team that he can play. And if that worked, that's great. Um, I almost, there's a part, I'm sure if you're an LA galaxy fan, you're almost asking Julian Araujo not to get the playing time again, just so we can continue to have the chip on his shoulder that, <laughs> that he has had and, and played for this. It just, he doesn't seem like a guy who's going to be, easily placated he's not going to be a guy who's satisfied so I, I don't worry about that i have a feeling that any national team time that he gets uh coming up on wednesday uh will only be used to sort of fuel him on it seems like that's a progression and a step for him and for for right now when we've seen him kevin when he's taken steps forward he's matched those he's matched intensity he's brought his game up to that level so let's see on a we'll call it a national team level because it certainly is but on a much pared down u.s men's national team uh, all domestic players i think for the most part um and so it's a it's a different sort of camp it's a it's a little more camp cupcake uh, certainly as the january camps usually are um but it, it's just it, he's going to be put in a situation now where he's going to need to per, you know perform and so we'll see what julian araujo does with that and how this training with the u.s men's national team does and hopefully for both of these guys araujo and alvarez you want to see whatever happens on the national team uh fuel them on the la galaxy because if either of those kids you know, sort of sit back on their laurels or, or try to rest and try to catch a breath. Um, uh, certainly with what is going to be a ridiculously congested year. We talk about the Olympics and all the other tournaments that have sort of been pressed off World Cup qualifying, all these things that are going to be happening on the national team level and, you know, on on the Olympics and, and, and all these different things that are happening, all the different competition, the Leagues Cup and all these things that are going to happen. So super condensed schedule. These kids are going to need to have sort of that mental fortitude and that that drive to get through all this stuff. Yeah, and I'm kind of surprised that Mexico, knowing that Julian Araujo was frustrated because he he didn't keep uh, he didn't keep that quiet, that Mexico didn't give him a call and call him up. I know Geraldo Torado, um, who is the uh, you know director of the Mexican national team program, uh, was a great national team player there for L3. That uh, he said that Julian Araujo was a guy that they knew about and that they were very interested in. That would have seemed to be the time if they were really interested to to sort of send out a feeler, and they didn't. Um, and so, you know, it's possible they, they may not lose him uh, to the U.S. national team, especially if, if Araujo starts getting an opportunity to play, which is all he really wants, and I understand that, uh, and that's all to the good. And, and you're right. I mean, the more experience these guys get with the national team, uh, the better it's going to be. We saw what that did to Sebastian Lejet as well. I think it made a big difference in his career. He wound up getting hurt right when he was really gaining some of that momentum from the national team. But when Bruce Arena called him up for World Cup qualifiers, uh, back in 2017, I think that made a big difference in his career. Yeah, it definitely does. So uh, all these decisions upcoming for the LA Galaxy, uh, all things to watch. Uh, let's get to uh, a little bit of some crazy and stupid rumors that we're certainly going to talk about, just not in any general sort of sense, to just sort of sit there and say relax and breathe a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, you had Falcao. Falcao, who is currently at Galatasaray, uh, is apparently out uh, out from that team that he is able to leave. Uh, they want to get rid of him mostly because I think he's been injured for about half the games uh, and, and he's played in half the games and they're sick of the injuries and they're sick of the money and, and all the different things that sort of come through there. The only reason I even mention this, by the way, Kevin, is one, because it's an injured guy who is certainly um, you know well-known around the world. So you're talking about a well-known name that the LA Galaxy, I'm sure, would love to have if perhaps they lose somebody like Christian Pavone. And we haven't heard any updates on Christian Pavone, so just you know, sit tight on that. We, we keep waiting to see uh, whether or not some rumors are true or some rumors are not true. Um, but there's been a lot of talk around Pavone. But if, if Falcao comes in, um, you're looking at a guy w at Galatasaray. And if you remember, uh, Nigel DeYoung, I believe, came from Galatasaray whenever the LA Galaxy were able to sort of get that contract terminated and then uh, terminated, bought out, and then he came to the LA Galaxy for, for a little bit of a deal. Um, so there is some history between those two clubs and at least uh, taking some, some different things. I feel like this one's a stretch. It doesn't feel like it's, it's anything real. It feels like people are just sort of throwing things out. One of the things that was in this article it said uh you know falcao will be going to david beckham's la galaxy um now translation issue possibly could it be like david beckham's like his old team that they, they were trying to trying to say yes that's true uh could it be going to miami instead because that's david beckham's team yes that's also true so um all of those things uh usually point to something not being true in any of them but it could be true in one way or the other i just thought that one that was the, that one doesn't like stir anybody's emotions does it kevin you're not like oh this has to happen right 
No, I, I think one of the things we have to look at with these rumors is, uh, first of all, the galaxy is going to come up in every conversation. As you and I talked before the pod, there is going to be a rumor shortly that Maradona is going to rise from the grave and sign with the galaxy because the galaxy, are, it, they're the big club in MLS still. They're the ones with the the global um, you know, platform. The people know them. Um, so any player that's coming to uh, MLS is probably coming to the Galaxy, whether they are or not. That's where the rumors are going to start. And so we have to field these rumors on every player. But I think you have to think with all MLS clubs, does this rumor fit? I mean, you know, here's a guy you're talking about uh, at Galatasaray who's not playing a lot. He's an older player. He's injury prone. Why would the Galaxy, who are going young with Araujo and Alvarez and Pavone is a young player, 24, um, you know, Chicharito is a little older in the tooth, but um, uh, still not that age. Why would the Galaxy, who are building a rather a relatively young core, why would they want to go out and get a player that age? The same thing with Inter-Miami. They just, uh, you know, my understanding is they just got rid of a whole bunch of older players, AJ De La Garza being one. Um, they're going younger as well. So why would a team in the, in the midst of a youth movement throw all that out the window and bring in an older injury-prone name player for a couple of years just because he has a big name that blows up the whole thing you're trying to build. And as you talk about Seattle and you talk about Minnesota and Nashville, now teams that are building to be good year over year. um, If you want to keep up in MLS, you can't do that. You can't do that. Steven Gerrard for a year and a half. And we'll start over again after that. You, you have to build year on year. And so I, you know, I think when you look at those rumors, you really do have to take them with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean they're not going to, happen if you had told me that steven gerrard was coming to the galaxy even two days before he came or zlatan i wouldn't have believed you and one of those worked out and the other one didn't but i think it's time mls is the point now in its development where you need to start building and having a plan that works year over year yeah it's well it's tough yeah as we mentioned mls almost dictates that that doesn't work that you can't have that uh, but you've seen teams have success with that so you need to find out a formula as you said that does work year over year at least in in terms of replacing certain players bringing in other players um the other it, <laughs> The other rumor, we'll put rumor in quotation marks. Rumor is already something that says it's necessarily not true, but we'll put it in quotation marks to make it even less true. Um, Jonathan Dos Santos apparently uh, possibly uh, wanted by Club America, and Club America may be ready to get rid of you know Memo Ochoa, goalkeeper Memo Ochoa, um, and that would be a trade that you know a transfer back and forth that would happen between the two clubs uh, with with Jonathan Dos Santos going to um, going to join his brother Giovanni Dos Santos at Club America for Memo Ochoa. Uh, there's there's so many things that probably pop up into this and say there's no way this happens. Um, but I, I figured we'd at least throw it out there so that people could hear it and maybe have a chuckle or something, right? Well, yeah. Well, let's talk about um, Giovanni Dos Santos because if Jonathan went there, um, there's a chance his brother's not going to be there. He's not already. He's not on the roster for the uh, CONCACAF Champions League coming up later this month. Club America is not taking him to Orlando. So why, I wonder, would Jonathan want to entertain a trade to Club America if his brother's not going to be there? Yeah, and that's a draw. Yeah, I mean, that that should be the draw right there. They're supposed to have both of them together. In fact, it was rumored that Giovanni Dos Santos might be headed to Chivas um, in Mexico. So it's you look at that and say, okay, that probably doesn't make sense. Also, you know, Memo Ochoa is 30-some, 35? Is he 35? I keep wanting to say 35. For everybody I hear recently, I've wanted to say their, their age is 35. But Memo Ochoa getting up there in age. Um, and so, you know, the Yellow Galaxy are probably going to be goalkeeping shopping this year. Um, I'm usually not a big fan of using an international spot on a goalkeeper uh, and whether or not Memo Ochoa fits that glove or not. It just it seems like it's far fetched. I don't believe any of this is going now. Here's one thing that sort of backs this up is that, yes, the LA Galaxy do need a goalkeeper. So you can certainly say, okay, well, that part of it might check out. Um, The second part of that is that you look at Jonathan Dos Santos. If it is true and we believe it is that Jonathan Dos Santos only has one year left on his contract, Kevin. Now and, you know, this winter time and this summer is the time when you have to move him if you're going to get him for anything. Right. And there's always the question mark about whether you let the contract expire and then he goes somewhere for free. Um, Usually the one year mark is when you can move players. Um, That's that's the best time because it, it puts the leverage in the selling team's favor, which is, hey, you want Jonathan Dos Santos. 
you, well, I guess you could wait a year and then maybe you'd get them or maybe you wouldn't, or, you know, you, maybe you wait six months and, you know, maybe somebody else takes them or, or they, it just, it usually works that with one year left on a contract, players are able to move easier than players at six months where six months, the, the buying team can say, you know what, we'll just wait six months until he get, until he's, he's ready and then we'll take him. So there is, if the LA Galaxy were going to move Jonathan Dos Santos, if they were going to find a place for him, now is the time to do it because if you wait any longer, the 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 leverage starts to sway away from uh, the team, the LA Galaxy, and go towards whoever is either thinking of, of buying or waiting for him basically to be um, you know out of contract and get him for free. Well, one theory always is you trade a player one year too soon rather than one year too late, meaning you trade him while he still can can produce a little bit on the field and you give up one good season as opposed to holding on to him until he's beyond his, you know, sell by date. And then all of a sudden you not only can't you get anything for him, but you, you, you've started, you've been playing him during his, uh, his decline. So you always want to trade a guy one year too soon rather than one year too late. Interesting thing about Giovanni Dos Santos. Do you know which club team he's made the most appearances for? And this is by 20 games. He's 20, 20 more games for one club than any other club. Do you know which team that is? No, tell me. The Galaxy. He played 77 games for the Galaxy. This is a guy, Gio De, Giovanni Dos Santos. Again, we're talking about not on Club America's roster for uh, CCL, maybe on the move again. This is a guy who's already at 31, played for Barcelona, Tottenham, it's it's switched town, Galatasaray, Racing Santander, Mallorca, uh, Villarreal, the Galaxy, now Club America, could be on the move again. He played 77 games for the Galaxy, 57 for Villarreal. Uh, so the Galaxy is the team he's played the most for, and it seemed like he was here not all that long. I mean, I know it seemed long and when you were watching him play, but uh, to think about a guy with his talent, 107 games for the Mexican national team, you know, three World Cups, that uh, um, the Galaxy is the one club team he's been been with the most. And he was only here, what, three and a half seasons? Uh, it was longer than that, wasn't it? I think you're going to find it was it was it feels like it was much longer. It, you may have been absolutely right. It's almost four years. That sounds like maybe it's close. I thought it was closer to five though. I can actually look that up if we if we. Stall. Well, he came in in the middle of 20, 2015. So it was at the end of twenty fifteen, half of twenty fifteen, and sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen, and then he left at um, at nineteen because they needed the money. They needed the open uh, DP spot for. For Zlatan, so that would be three and a half seasons. And by the way, it's when you're talking about bringing Memo Choa, and yes, the Galaxy probably need to think about um, the goaltending situation, goalkeeping situation. I, th I think Klinsman is a guy that uh, they're, they're negotiating with. I think he would be a good guy to bring back as an understudy and to get some more experience. He's a young player. I think he's 22 if they can get him for the right price. Um, David Bingham, he's uh, on the wrong side of 30. Um you know, had some some tough stretches the last couple of seasons. If the Galaxy could find uh, an option, uh, you know, or, or another guy who could compete for that starting goal uh, keeper spot with Jonathan Klinsman, I think they'd want to do it. I don't think a 35 year old, as we just mentioned, a team that is starting to build a young core, probably a 35 year old guy is not going to be someone who's around much. But you know, tonight's game showcased a guy. Tonight's uh, Minnesota United game showcased a guy in. Uh, in Dwayne St. Clair with Minnesota, mm -hmm. that he, he had a less than a goal a game, goals against average. He had three straight shutouts in the playoffs. This is a young Canadian who started the year on a USL team, uh, a guy that really proved that he's good. Well, who is the, the, the supposed starting goalkeeper at Minnesota United? It's Tyler Miller, who came over from LAFC, was unbeaten in five games this year until he had a hip injury in training and was out for the season, had to go in and get surgery, and St. Clair took over. Minnesota United is not going to bring back both those guys. They're both starting goalkeepers. Um, I think one of them will be on the move. I don't know which one, but if they think the Galaxy would be smart to reach out and to see if there's a possibility they could acquire one of those guys, one or the other. They're both now proven goalkeepers, um, and I, I think that would be – and they're both young. They're both under 30. I think that would be an upgrade over the situation they have now. So I don't think Memo Cho is the only answer out there. I think there's some right in MLS that probably are going to be quite a bit cheaper. Well, one is goalkeepers, uh, you know, uh, age like fine wine. So usually 35 to 40 is still a, a, an applicable age for, for goalkeepers. So David Bingham isn't too old. 
Um, I, I would worry. It, it, here's the thing, and I've always, I, I think I've seen this the way. If the LA Galaxy hired Dominic Kinnear, I think that David Bingham has a much better chance of, of staying with the LA Galaxy. Dominic Kinnear and David Bingham go way back. That's his guy. It would make some sense. I could also see it going. And I think he'd play better. And I think he'd play much better with Dominic, frankly. I yeah, think yeah. that would be a good thing for David Bingham in a lot of ways. Yeah, if it's any other coach, I, I think David Bingham is probably looking for another team. Um, and so, you know, you, you can look at those things and, and sort of see if those, those match up, but yeah, I, I'm, you know, goalkeeping is a posi- is a place that I think the LA galaxy can upgrade. Um, but they can also downgrade pretty easily as well. I mean, David Bingham was not the best goalkeeper in major league soccer. Certainly not. He wasn't the worst either. Uh, the LA galaxy defense certainly didn't help him out in any sort of form or fashion. So, you know, it's another one of those things you get rid of David Bingham. Um, he could go to some team and actually make a, a good run into the playoffs with them. No problem. I could see that. So the yeah, LA Galaxy just sort of have to play that one carefully. It's about money more than anything else. If you can get David Bingham at a reasonable price, um, then maybe that makes sense to keep him um, just because you sort of know what you're getting. I, I go back to uh, to to the infamous, you know, if you know, it, sometimes even even a mediocre player is exactly who you need if you know what you're getting and you can get that all the time and you and you understand exactly what you're getting from that player. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things to watch in Major League Soccer. You need mediocre players that play si- slightly above their their mediocrity sometimes kevin in major league soccer in order to make a team good you need those depth pieces you need those people who are somehow going to raise their game up to a level uh, above their pay um in, in major league soccer and really in order to to do that so the motivational side of things really is important um uh, from from coaches and everybody else it's a it's an interesting time um there's a lot of dead space between news that sort of comes out now in terms of the la galaxy uh, they apparently chose not to do exit interviews, which has been their thing. Um, I'm not so sure why they choose not to have players uh, talk. Maybe they think nothing good can come of it, Kevin. That's the only thing I can think of is that having players talk about how horrible the season is, is, is there's nothing good that comes out of that. Um, but for people like you and me who cover the team on you know a daily basis, it's our chance really to find out where people's heads are at, um, where players' heads are at at the end of the year, having been slightly removed from that stuff. It's a real disservice, I think, to the fans um, and to the people who cover this team on a regular basis that y- you don't have exit interviews from these guys. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and other teams, Atlanta United, did theirs the day after their final uh, regular season game, and they still have a, uh, another tournament left. They're in CONCACAF Champions League as well. So it was, uh, you know, other teams have done it. Uh, you know, never accuse me of giving the Galaxy an even break. Generally, I, I always look for the, the worst case scenario as well. But this time I'm going to give them a break and say that I don't know that it was anything that sinister. I think it had a lot to do with the coronavirus and the whole COVID uh, situation because a lot of their uh, communications personnel have had hours cut and, and uh, you know, they're, they're already working uh, hours that they're not getting paid for. So trying to set up exit interviews would have just added to that. And the other thing is it's much easier in the past when we've gone out there and guys are cleaning out their lockers and we get them on their way out. Uh, I remember that one year that Giassi's artist came out with a whole uh, Santa's Santa's sack full of uh, soccer shoes he was going to take and give the kids in the community that he'd collected from his teammates. But as guys are coming out of the locker room, they pause and they talk to us. And it's pretty easy to set up. And uh, it's no fuss, no muss, and we get most of the players. This year would have to be a Zoom thing. We'd have to arrange it ahead of time. We'd have to tell them which players we wanted. They'd have to make sure those players were there at the time that the Zoom call was being uh, was being performed. So I, I'm going to give the Galaxy a break on this one and just say – it would have been a little bit difficult to organize and it probably wasn't worth it. Um, and, uh, you know, if we wanted to reach out and try to get a player, they might help us do that. But, uh, you know, I don't think anything was that sinister this year. Um, and that's saying a lot for me because I do think most of the things they do are pretty sinister. <laughs> I was going to say, it's just, what happened to you? Did you hit your head? Are you feeling okay? Are you concussed? Do I need to call Taylor Twelman? Uh, all right. Very good. Well, I, I think that's it. Do you have anything else you wanted to touch on? Because we're, we're basically running out of time. I didn't think we'd have an hour, but um, we're, we're, we're right did about we, that, Mark. Did we get through everything on your little checklist there? We did, as a matter of fact. Uh, wow. Not very many things on the checklist, but we were able to fill in some gaps and, uh, yeah. and talk about some other mm-hmm. things. So, yeah, we're, we're good. You, you, are you fine? 
Yeah, you're good. All right. Uh, if you're looking for Mr. Uh, Kevin Baxter on Twitter, you can contact him at kbaxter11. And then please head on over to the LA Times where he's doing all the coverage of uh, soccer in Southern California, both teams in uh, in SoCal. Uh, he does some U.S. men's national team stuff, some national coverage. So make sure you follow him uh, and read his stuff at latimes.com. If you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at jgesman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and then at Galaxy Podcast. And please head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Uh, the Hammer has his grading the galaxy. He just did the midfielders end of season stuff. So you're going to want to check that out as well. All right. Uh, that does it. Uh, should have another show on Thursday. Should is pretty much how we're going to roll through this off season. So uh, should have a live show on Thursday. Just check out the website or, or check out Twitter or the discord or any of those places. We'll tell you where to find it. All right. For Kevin, the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Pato Guessman. You've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo. And on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.